just a moment of, uh, of stupidity and bang, could have been easily blinded for the rest of my life. So whack them on, mate, whack the gear on, very important. Look at this thing. That's just going to last about one more pull, so it's got to be replaced. I'm better off to replace it. I'm also going to have a look at this um, this pulley roller here as well while I'm at it. For every minute of uh, glamour sailing, there's five hours of bullshit. No joke. Oh, Jesus Christ, the effort. Unbelievable. Okay, you can see my problem here. The other day when we uh, were having a bit of an incident, check this shit out. So what this is, is the cable's actually gotten caught in these gears, chewed up these cables, and um, to replace it is no easy feat, I'll tell you. So I've um, come up with a solution. So again, look at this thing. That's just going to last about one more pull, so it's got to be replaced, and better off to replace it. I'm also going to have a look at this um, this pulley roller here as well while I'm at it, and uh, and I'm going to put a guide here somewhere, basically over here, with a roller on it, that's going to try to control and maybe a tube or something to uh, to direct the cable away from this palaver here, because there's this problem with this is. Uh, just always going to happen and it's never it's got no shielding it's absolutely bloody ridiculous to be honest i can't believe how cheap we made it is so the incident uh that i alluded to earlier on was the inadvertent um man overboard practice that we uh performed why i threw janet overboard or in fact she slipped overboard um as a result of us, uh, you know, in a mild panic, trying to get control of the situation and trying to find a very shallow anchorage where we could take stock of the of the day's event, um, we rushed to swing the keel up in a hurry, and as a result of uh, overwinding, we caught the cable in in the gears of the uh, of the cable winch, which resulted in uh, obviously the the splintering or the fraying of that cable. Now. To access this swing keel is no easy uh, task and putting a boat off a trailer um, is, is not an easy task either. So it required a lot of thinking. I used uh, a bunch of pallets with a pallet jack to raise the stern of the, uh, of the trailer sailor. And as you can see here, I've got uh, Johnny and, uh, and Josh giving me a hand to, uh, to lock the, the trailer sailor onto the pallets. And then uh, we were able to then push it backwards as I rolled the car forward and, uh, and pulled the trailer forward. It was actually a very good exercise because I'd never uh, had to do anything like this before. And it did actually work uh, pretty much spot on. The only, the only thing was, while ever the trailer was attached to the vehicle, it did need to uh, have some jack stands uh, placed underneath the back of the trailer. Those jack stands are... Um, uh, are just vital to holding the whole thing in place while we then uh, were able to activate the the uh, the swing keel and lower it down and I thought while I've got it in this position I may as well repair the whole swing keel and as well uh, I decided that um, I was going to anti-foul her for going on the mooring um, at the same time so it sat there for about two weeks in this position while I prepared it um, essentially got the swing curl fixed, fixed a, a number of small gel code issues that were on it as well, and, and ultimately got the, uh, the anti-fouling done, which I'm going to put in a further episode. So uh, this is the process of getting her off, and it certainly uh, was a bit of a, a roundabout way of getting it off, but it did actually work, and it was very, very, uh, very, very effective in, in giving me good access underneath the boat, particularly with that swing curl. So I hope you've enjoyed this little, uh, this little time lapse and, uh, of, this, um, of this process. Johnny, what I'll do, mate, is I'll get the jack. I'll just see how far I need to drop the keel down. 
So once we had the boat in position, um, and giving me around about eight or nine feet of clearance underneath, I was able to then jack the trailer up, whack in some jack stands, and then I was able to relieve the vehicle, the trailer, pull it away and leave it in position like that for a number of weeks while I uh, got all the work done. Um, it did put a little bit of stress on the trailer, I have to admit. Um, there's a fair bit of weight there. I guess this boat's around about eight, 900 kilos. So um, just having that jack stand on the back there, I'd, I'd certainly probably prop it up with pallets or something next time just to make sure that I've got the the, uh, the necessary support under it. But uh, the jack stand did actually put a fair amount of pressure on the the rear frame of the of the trailer. Okay, so I'm going to wind this down, and I'm filming underneath as well. Hopefully we're filming, and uh, I'm going to wind this guy down until it hits the, the ground at the bottom and hopefully I've got access to the shackle. I'm praying that's going to be enough to um, just want to watch my eyes in case this bloody cable snaps. That would not be good. The one thing I've noticed already is this pawn is not rolling so that's a bit of a, a problem in itself. So there we go, we've hit the bottom. Let's go and have a look. What I've enabled the access to now. Okay, so here I am underneath the beast. Um, you can see this big hockey stick type keel. It's um, shaped like a, an ice hockey stick, and uh, yeah, basically that's my ballast. But uh, here's my problem up in here. So here we go. Here's the eye bolt here that I've got to uh, uh, replace this this swaged cable. Okay, so I've just been into town to the local uh, chandlery and um, yeah, came up with a bit of a solution. Easy. Pre-built cable. And I'm going to put a, um, a D-shackle on it so that I can undo it and then an inspection hatch on the inside centre box. So this restoration that I wasn't going to do is turning into a full-blown restoration. got to love a good project. <laughs> got plenty of room. I'm actually going to uh, sand and anti-foul this boat as well. Give it a sand back, put, uh, two, put a layer of um, primer coat on it and then, uh, and then two layers of, uh, of, of anti-foul which is about to go on the mooring for me and uh, hopefully get this project out of the way. Oh, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, find the hole. Here we go. Yes. And that was easy enough. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. So down in here, there's a little um uh, bolt that uh, looks like zinc plated crap to be honest but uh, in any case this holds the cable on and uh, I'm gonna have to grind this flat because it's not uh, it's not gonna fit in here so I've got to grind a bit off it hold up shackle here and then and that way I can replace it from the inside of the boat. Gotcha. Shackle. Yep. Right, are you ready? Yep. Here we go. The wind it up. Oh, ledge. Is that it? Okay, so after a good few hours of work, I've got a nice clean winch assembly. I've totally serviced the winch. It's all uh, been greased up. This wheel here is now rotating. I've come up with a bit of a solution uh, for the chafing of the cable where it runs into the winch. I'm going to actually get a piece of this um, copper pipe. I haven't got any stainless or any gal pipe. Um, with a batten screw down the middle of it and uh, 
basically I'll just cut this pipe and then um, mount it and it'll sort of act as a bit of a roller guide to uh, keep the bloody cable out of the winch handle, out of the winch gears. So you can see my dilemma here. I've got this um, this cable, it runs into here, but right here, we've got two really serious gears here where this cable got caught in there and that was the problem. That's why I've had to replace it. So I've come up with this idea. If I put this roller somewhere along this, this area here to, uh, to guide it. The only problem is I can't really put that one in because it's hitting the bottom of the, the cover plate. But um, if I put it back here somewhere, then I should be able to circumvent it moving across and hitting the gears. And I think about right about there, we'll um, just train it to continue to go to this side and, and therefore stay out of the, the gearing because, um, yeah, that's a bit of a silly design, really. And then the other problem I've got is I've got this cover, which is actually the step. And, uh, you know, and I've got these star ports here, which actually form a table. But I reckon if I put it, so this fits in here, which covers the whole box and dice, and uh, that by putting a, a big bugle or a, a batten screw, a gal batten screw, down through here through that tube, um, I should get some control over to where that cable's going rather than uh, chewing up another one. Which was, you know, it's taken me a good day to fix this thing, and it's right here. Hard to tell where it is, but anyway, so that's just off center. Now you guys are getting some great photos of my legs here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Doing the man spread. Yeah, that's, uh... All my years of uh, servicing dive equipment over the years have, uh, have served me well when it comes to this thing. This is the main pump assembly of my um, my gel coat spray machine, my pumping machine. And uh, we've got a number of balls, springs, washers, o-rings, spring o-rings. And there's a number of things that need to be uh, put in in, in correct order. Uh, funnily enough, it doesn't matter how many times I do it. I still RTFM, I read the manual, effing manual, um, which, and in fact that's about all I got with it, so the rest of it's been sort of, had to be a little bit intuitive. Um, I just want to reiterate the importance of safety to every single one of us out there. Honestly, I see some pretty dodgy stuff on uh, on uh, all of these channels, and uh, you know we, we're all guilty of it. So let's not point the finger at anyone. Um, I'll just highlight what happened to me a moment ago. Well, I came up onto the mole to do a bit of laminating, and uh, my machine in the background here has sat idle for around about a month. I gave it a good service, cleaned it all, you know, basically got it all uh, ready to go again so that when I walked up here, I could basically just switch it on, insert the pump into the resin, and off I go. There was a problem. As soon as I applied pressure, because there was catalyst sitting in one of the latent lines, uh, one of these ones up here, the ones that feed out of the catalyst line, uh, catalyst is pretty corrosive stuff, and uh, the PVC pipe or the tubing that feeds the catalyst uh, has developed a small fissure in it and as soon as I put it under pressure about a cupful of uh, Norox MEKP which is uh, specifically uh, formulated for vinyl ester went that way luckily uh, spurted towards the tent end and not my eye if it had gone in my eye it would be instant blindness especially under about 200 psi pressure so um, vital guys can't stress it enough going to be like your dad here 
put on some safety gear, at least have glasses on, even a freaking full face mask. I've just learned the best lesson. I always wear these when I'm dealing with catalyst. Just a moment of, uh, of stupidity and bang, could have been easily blinded for the rest of my life. So whack them on, mate, whack the gear on. Very important. Was um, This gauge here, um, basically as soon as I activated the pump and turned him on, the catalyst has flowed up out of the catalyst down this white tube here and gone back to the reflux tube and under pressure this reflux tube here uh, must have had a pinhole in it and I've just discovered it's rooted absolutely rooted and uh, out of that little crack came about a cupful and I've got it here a cupful of catalyst um, before I got a chance to turn everything down and, and it's the corrosion and the uh, obviously we've got a problem with um, uh, some sort of corrosion or perhaps under pressure so she's got to go yuck so I've gone and uh, got the best so I'll move you back here best solution I can come up with in an emergency. Uh, I've got this um, black PVC tubing, which is similar to the white stuff. Hopefully it's the same. It's the same diameter at least. There's a small olive fitting on here, and then that uh, goes on to this nipple here, and then uh, it's tightened down. And I'm gonna monitor this um, pretty regularly now after I know about this problem. So after a successful uh, maintenance um, program on the machine and a couple of uh, uh, hidden problems, um, I continued on with my test piece after laying a couple of layers in the hole, I then uh, moved on to laying a couple more layers on my test piece. I've been doing this all the way through and laying them at the same time to ensure the humidity and the controlled environment has remained the same. This piece will then be uh, uh, submitted to Australian Maritime Safety to uh, ensure um, that I've done what I say I've done and uh, and yeah we basically uh, completed this particular panel on this day when I did the last uh, layer on the hull so uh, good process it gives me a, a, a good piece of, um, of, of uh, sample of my hull and it's significantly uh, thick and uh, a very very sound piece of glass. Right, eh? so I'm down to the last layer of uh, the 600 double bias that has to go down on this test piece, and then it'll be one 300 uh, layer on top of it as a tie layer uh, for the final layer. So right down here I have uh, 300, 300, 300, 1200, 1200, 300, 300, 300, 300, 300, 600, 600, 300. And that's the thickness of my hole. Uh, that reflects exactly my keel line along the, uh, the hull line, and, and that's a pretty significant piece of glass. So once this is finished, this is gonna go undergo some, uh, I've got to cut up to 600 mil square, and then I'm gonna send it off for destructive testing to, uh, to ensure that my hull is, as I've said it is, down in there, down along that keel line. So provided uh, that's okay, and it passes the test, cool. That's how it works, so uh, one more layer to go and uh, this test piece is finished.